No doubt this is a familiar gospel passage to all of us. It's not the first time we've heard it. And if you uh, take any time with it, you might even say it's an interesting conversation that takes place between Jesus and the scribes. But there is a connection that Jesus is trying to make. He links forever the commandment to love God with the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. When asked for the greatest single commandment, what does Jesus do? He actually answers by naming two commandments, loving God and loving neighbor. They necessarily, intrinsically, if you will, go hand in hand. They go together like salt and pepper. In Jesus' time, this answer was surprising because it put love for neighbor on the same level or on par with love for God. No one had ever done that before. Everyone simply agreed that loving God came first. Loving one's neighbor was good, was right, was just, but it was secondary. The primary thing was love of God. And so Jesus does what today? He challenges us. Jesus challenges, uh, challenges those assumptions. True love for God. And what does he teach? He teaches us that it cannot exist apart from true love for neighbor. You cannot love God if you do not love your neighbor. If someone claims to love God, that invisible love can be verified in the way they treat their neighbor. You know, in our day, and on the other hand, perhaps the more surprising aspect in the priority Jesus gives to loving God, our postmodern world has in many ways given up on the idea of God. The sheer quantity of religions and denominations and their inability to agree on doctrines has created, I would say, an indifference, maybe even a cynical indifference. Government and popular culture have almost succeeded in keeping God from all of us. You know, when the seculars do agree about something, it's not about loving God. It's not about loving oneself. They're more concerned, you know, about other things. You know, not that these aren't important, because they are. And I know you're wondering, what is he saying? Well, you know, we can talk about diversity. We can talk about toleration. We can talk about random acts of kindness and paying it forward. These are things we can sink our teeth into, so they say. And yet, is it really possible to make the sustained effort necessary for truly Christian love of neighbor without staying connected to the reason why our neighbor ought to be loved. You cannot love your neighbor without loving your creator. If I don't love the God in, whom, in whose image my neighbor is created, how long and how deeply can I really, truly love my neighbor? 
Many years ago, and before my time, but not all that far off, I didn't know or enjoy his company, but the venerable Fulton Sheen, who was from New York, or at least served in New York and Rochester, told the story of a nun who was caring for a very, very sick uh, patient. And the patient's leprosy was well advanced. Uh, rotting skin, uh, the smell of decaying flesh, it was putrefying, you know, it was very, um, it was very, um, very appalling to even be in the person's presence. And the nun attended to the patient with remarkable gentleness and kindness. It was as if she didn't even notice how grotesque the disease had made this person. A visitor to the hospital stood and watched for a few moments. And when the nun had finished, the visitor went up to her with a grimace of disgust on his face and said to her, Sister, I wouldn't do what you just did for a million dollars. And the nun smiled and said back to the gentleman, Neither would I. You see, my friends, true love for our neighbor can't be based on how much we like our neighbor or how much we can get from our neighbor. Those motivations won't last, and they won't lead us to the true self-giving that Christ-like involved, Christ-like love involves. True love, you see, for our neighbor can only come from a true love for God in whose image not only were we created in, but also our neighbor. Loving God and neighbor are the great commandments. They are the path to true happiness and to a full life. When someone says to me, Father, my life is empty and I'm wandering about. I want to do something. The best way that I can advise that person is by saying to that person or persons, then give of yourself. Give of yourself to someone in need. Volunteer your time, either to your parish, to your community, or to a variety of other, uh, a host of other agencies outside the walls of the church. All of us here today love God, and we love our neighbor. But our love is still immature, no matter how old we are or how young, because our love has room to grow. Our love can become stronger. And as it gets stronger, so will the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit at work in our own life, in our soul. And that's what we're all hoping for. So, you know, what can we do? What can we do to strengthen our love for God, you know, in order for our love to grow? Well, not only do we have to live a virtuous life, we have to allow all virtues, the virtue of love, you know, grows with exercise, just like our muscles do. The more you lift weights, the stronger you get. So what am I encouraging you to do this week? This week, let's go to the spiritual gym, if you will. Let's exercise our love for God and our love for neighbor. We don't have to, we don't have to do anything crazy. We just have to do something. Just something intentional. Not what we're expected to do. Something other than that. 
something other than a chore that a parent asks us or a neighbor asks of us. Traditionally, the church gives us a lot of help by identifying ways we can exercise this love. And do you know what they're called? They're called the works of mercy, the corporal works of mercy, and the spiritual works of mercy. And for those of you who don't remember them, look them up or listen to them. The corporal works of mercy, you know, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the sick or the imprisoned, ransoming slaves, especially those who come into our country, sheltering the homeless, burying the dead. Those are physical things that we can do. But the spiritual works of mercy are just as important. You know, instructing the ignorant, counseling the doubtful, admonishing sinners charitably, bearing wrongs patiently, forgiving offenses willingly, comforting the afflicted, praying for the living and the dead. These works of mercy couldn't be a better opportunity for us to practice as we embark on a very special month in our church, November, when the church asks us literally to take on a spiritual and even a corporal work of mercy, burying the dead and praying for the dead. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, obviously, but most likely one or two of those works of mercy should strike a chord with you. They should really touch your heart so that you can touch the lives of someone else. We call them random acts of kindness. Maybe they're little random acts of love and charity. Just take one of them, maybe. Focus on that this week and see, see what happens, not only in someone else's life, but in your own life.